citizen researcher I like. Um, I'm also a kind of academic, but I should say immediately that this isn't an academic report. Uh, it draws on previously published information, all in the public domain, uh, much of it thanks to the brilliant work of Carol and other journalists like her and the DCMS committee. And essentially what we've done is to pull this wealth of publicly available information together and put it into the context of Facebook's history. And I hope it's obvious that the subject of this report is very far from being academic. Uh, so it summarises and builds on the excellent work of the DCMS committee, also of other parliamentary committees in Canada and the European Parliament as well, and work of the Information Commissioner's Office who published an excellent report and fined Facebook £500,000, the maximum possible fine, uh, a few months ago. And although the report does give uh, a full history of Facebook to give some kind of context for recent events, almost every day uh, new news emerges, and Carol may well have more news for us today or very soon. So it's very far from being comprehensive in that way as well. And despite the best efforts of the DCMS committee and of Carol and other journalists, we still don't know the full extent of the ways in which Facebook data was used to target disinformation and misleading advertising on voters in the UK in 2016. But it's clear that this took place on an extremely large scale. And please don't imagine it's not still happening. It is very much still happening as we speak. As the DCMS committee has described, um, in 2016, both ends of the Leave campaign were pumping industrial volumes of disinformation at people here, using the Canadian company AIQ to uh, devise, to test and to target these ads, Facebook ads, for this purpose. We've only illustrated one of these so-called dark ads in our report, and it carried the completely false message, the EU stops us from protecting polar bears. But there were literally hundreds of thousands of other such ads, each one calibrated to appeal to a particular identified susceptibility of a narrow target audience selected using Facebook data. And uh, one of the characteristics which was used to target people, uh, we know, and which was developed by Alexander Kogan, um, who passed his work on to Cambridge Analytica, was uh, low intelligence. It's by far from the only one. There are many areas of this story that are still murky, but what is clear is that it's almost inconceivable that this volume of disinformation didn't have a significant impact on voting patterns in the Brexit referendum. So what we have here is the most important vote in the UK since 1945, almost certainly critically impacted by disinformation, by wholesale data abuses, all of this facilitated by Facebook and all taking place under the radar of the regulator, the electoral regulator. And we know that the UK is very far from being the only country in which this has happened. So that's really the starting point for this report. How has this happened? How has it been allowed to happen? And how can we stop it from happening again? And answering those questions really meant looking at the whole way in which Facebook's business model operates, how it's come to occupy what's effectively a monopoly position in the social media sphere. And I hope that the history section of the report does that quite effectively and brings out the many ways in which Facebook has misled or simply lied to regulators and to the public about the abuses of data that it's enabled. So what can be done, just skipping very quickly forward to the recommendations bit of our report? Many of our proposals uh, align very closely with those of the excellent DCMS committee report, and Damien, uh, who was in charge of that, has just arrived. We're very glad to see. And we completely agree that Facebook needs to be held accountable for the information or disinformation that its algorithms channel towards users in the same kind of way as a publisher is held accountable. We also fully agree on the need for far greater transparency and user control over political advertising. Facebook has made some efforts in this direction, but these are absolutely not sufficient. And there's plenty of evidence that the same forces that were deluging voters, Facebook users, with uh, disinformation in 2016 are starting to do that again. 
this time to promote the hardest possible Brexit. It's not clear who's paying for these ads, and Facebook's recently introduced system of registration for political advertising doesn't go nearly far enough in terms of transparency. And there are a few areas in which we think the DCMS report recommendations perhaps don't go quite far enough. One is the role of the EU. It's absolutely clear that GDBR represents by far the most effective effort yet to curb abuses of personal data. And it's particularly urgent, I think, to recognise this now as Britain teeters on the edge of Brexit. A no-deal Brexit throws uh, the UK's position in relation to GDPR into question. And although the UK government has said that it intends to stay aligned to GDPR, in the immediate term, it hasn't given any long-term, com long-term commitment to do this. And I think the fact that Facebook operates across multiple jurisdictions is one reason why we stress the crucial need for international al alignment on regulation. We think GDPR should be used as a model, not just by the UK, but by any country looking at better regulation of Facebook and other tech giants. This would make it far easier to hold these companies to account across borders. And as we all know, data crosses borders with extreme ease and speed. And it's already clear that Facebook's data processing is gravitating towards countries with the uh, lowest level of regulation. Like us, the DCMS report discusses the need for a code of practice for social media companies. And we see the code of practice on disinformation that the EU is currently developing uh, in discussion with the tech giants as a very important first step in this direction. But at present, this is essentially a self-regulatory code, and it's worded in a way that makes adherence to it uh, voluntary and desirable rather than necessary. We think it should be absolutely compulsory and that the code needs to be much more tightly worded, uh, and it should be a legal requirement for social media firms with heavy penalties for any breaches. It could also be used, like GDPR, as the basis for regulation uh, in other countries outside the EU, and it could be adherence to this code becomes a prerequisite of such companies' license to operate. One particular area we think the code needs to be tightened up is on identity verification and automated posts by non-human agents, by bots. Um, opaque, fake identities make it extremely hard to tackle disinformation online, and although Facebook claims to be making efforts in this direction, it's definitely not gone far enough. Uh, we are recommending that identity verification be required for all user accounts and that any organisational pages, very importantly, should be linked to uh, named and legally founded organisations or associations with responsible named people behind them. Another key area that I'd highlight relates to Facebook's basic business model, its kind of monopoly position. And the report makes clear, I hope, that Facebook has routinely treated its users as, to use a term that Facebook executives have used themselves in the past, as inventory. In other words, as commodities to be packaged up and sold to the highest bidder. And this, to us, is the core of the problem. Users of Facebook create the vast majority of the company's value, and we think they, needed to, they need to be treated with far more respect as core stakeholders. And we think that any international code of practice needs to specify that users are represented both in the ownership of the company and at board level. At the very least, we think that users should have a board level representative chosen by users themselves to ensure that their interests are treated with respect. And finally, one last point. <laughs> Uh, I'd just like to emphasise that despite all of the abuses that we've described in this report and that Damien's committee has described, we don't see social media as an unmitigated evil. In fact, it could and it should be a powerful force for good. And there are some examples of how this can potentially happen. Uh, the best known probably is Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation. And that's done a huge amount to make reliable information information reliably available, available, freely available, without making anyone a multi-billionaire. We believe there needs to be a concerted effort to support the development of more truly social media, and that this is one very good use to which money raised from fines and levies on the tech giants like Facebook could be put. One phrase that's often cropped up 
uh, in the evidence given by expert witnesses to Damien's committee and to the other committees which we uh, summarise in the report is the phrase information ecosystem. And as Greens, of course, we're very interested in ecosystems and there's no doubt in our minds that Facebook is, to use that analogy, a major polluter. We think the polluter pays principle should apply to Facebook and that so far it's got off pretty much scot-free. But we also think that we need to be looking at new and less polluting ways of providing social media services and we hope that this report gives some pointers towards how that could be done. Thanks. Thank you.